Thank you. It's a personal delight and honor to be here to represent Fuller Theological Seminary, for whom uh, Carl Henry was one of our founding faculty, but also to uh, honor someone who had such a, a profound impact on my own Christian journey. My first encounter with Carl Henry occurred when the inaugural issue of Christianity Today arrived at our family's home in the fall of 1956. My father was a pastor, and in those early years, the magazine was sent to many clergy free of charge. I was 16 years old when, I, when that first issue appeared. And while I can't say that I picked it up and devoured it, I did see Billy Graham's name on the cover. And since Graham was and still is one of my spiritual heroes, I opened the magazine to read his article on biblical authority. And having gotten into the magazine, I also read Dr. Henry's editorial, Why Christianity Today? I wasn't well versed in the complexities of evangelical identity in those days, but when Henry referred to the need for evangelical scholarship and to the reality of a network of evangelical scholars working in various academic settings around the world, I did sense in my teenage naivete that this was something new in my spiritual environs. I hadn't heard much about the importance of evangelical scholarship or, or even many encouraging words about the need for careful thinking during my evangelical upbringing. On the contrary, I frequently heard anti-intellectual jabs aimed at folks who took the life of the mind seriously. In my childhood, for example, I could not have given any kind of definition of the word exegesis, but I could have told you that wherever it was, it was something that true Christians were to avoid at all costs. <clears throat> I learned that from a traveling revival preacher who had proclaimed that in contrast to what he had learned in the few seminary courses he had taken, and I quote, you don't need exegesis, you just need Jesus. <laughs> so when I opened that first issue of Christianity Today, I had the sense that Carl Henry was trying to tell us something different. And I clearly remember that my heart was strangely warmed. The warming increased significantly when a few years later, as a student at Houghton College, I enrolled in a, in a course entitled Christian Ethics. And once again, I had a significant encounter with Carl Henry. His book, Christian Personal Ethics, was not required reading for the course, but it was listed as one of the recommended readings for students who wanted to go a little deeper. <clears throat> and since Henry's name was by now a very familiar one to me, I checked the book out from the library's reserved reading shelf, and I made its way, my way through its pages. As my own later career as an ethicist has developed, I've often returned to the more theological chapters of Christian personal ethics, which make up the last three-fourths of the book. But I must confess that sitting in the Houghton College Library in 1959, it was the first 144 pages of Henry's discussion that, that grabbed me. In those pages, he offered a clear and concise survey of the history of philosophical ethics. Five years later, I was to begin my own uh, uh, work as a, as a scholar in ethics. And I took seminars where we studied, for example, the pre-Socratics in considerable detail. But when I began teaching that subject matter in my own courses, I often went back to Henry's 37-page overview for insights into, for example, the varieties of Epicurean thought, making use particularly of Henry's discussion of the hedonist understanding of ataraxia, the Greek word for tranquility. And I always went there with a sense of gratitude that it was Carl Henry who opened up for me that exciting world of ethical ideas. In 1947, Carl Henry had published his The Uneasy Conscience of modern fundamentalism. 
That too was a work in ethics, but much less rigorous than Christian personal ethics, which he was to publish a decade later. I also read The Uneasy Conscience as a college student, and it did open for me issues that uh, prepared me to take on many of the social political questions that were so prominent on the secular campuses where I did my graduate study in the 1960s. But again, The Uneasy Conscience was more of a Jeremiah than it was a systematic study. When a group of us began to call for more social action in the evangelical movement of the 1970s, I was known to complain publicly that Henry had restricted his pioneering foundational work in ethics to the personal dimension. While that complaint was factually accurate, it failed to take some important considerations into account. For one thing, Henry himself understood the limits of restricting ethical attention to the personal, and he had fully intended to take the next step into a scholarly treatment of the social. In his autobiography, he tells us that, and I quote, originally alongside of Christian personal ethics, I had hoped to produce a companion work on Christian social ethics as a, as a follow-up to the uneasy conscience of modern fundamentalism." End quote. The longer book was not to be written, however, because as soon as he finished writing Christian personal ethics, he took up the editorship of Christianity Today, a task that was to require his full attention for the next 12 years, after which he turned to other theological issues that he had come to see requiring sustained attention specifically matters of epistemology, authority, and revelation. He did, however, take a stab at uh, laying out some basic issues in the social sphere in his 1963 Peyton Lectures at Fuller Seminary, which were published in 1964 as uh, aspects of Christian social ethics. The focus of those lectures was, however, largely topical. He discussed work and leisure, the role of legislation, church-state relations, and the like. And without the sustained historical systematic character of Christian personal ethics. In aspects of Christian social ethics, though, in that book, Henry did touch upon the, the issues that he would have explored in greater depth if he had been able to follow through on his original intention to write a second major volume. In the book's introduction, Henry points to the final chapter of that book as being, as he put it, a fundamental import for the structure of social ethics. In that chapter, titled The Nature of God and Social Ideals, Henry zeroes in on the ways in which social thought must be grounded and on a proper understanding of God and of the divine attributes. Because, he said, and I'm quoting, Christian doctrine is a harmonious unity whose main axis is the nature of God. He went on to argue that much hangs on our clarity concerning the divine attributes. The topic is so fundamental, he says, that, and I'm quoting again, even the least adjustment of the divine perfections has consequences for theology and ethics. More specifically, he insists that, and I'm quoting again, righteousness and benevolence are equally ultimate in the unity of the divine nature, which means that we must worry when one is emphasis, emphasized at the expense of other, righteousness or benevolence. And then this, he says, even the smallest deviation from the biblical view of divine justice and divine benevolence eventually implies far-reaching consequences for the entire realm of Christian truth and life. Well, here's another good reason not to complain that Henry simply left us guessing about what a systematic treatment of social ethics would look like. To be sure, we would have been greatly helped had he written that more comprehensive volume. 
But we can be assured that it would have emphasized precisely the same foundational concerns that characterized his treatment of personal ethics, that all ethical thought that deserves to be called Christian, whether focusing on the personal or the social, has to be grounded in a proper, biblically faithful theology of the nature of God. And this is precisely what Henry was getting at when at the beginning of Christian personal ethics, he called for evangelicals to formulate what he described as a comprehensive, revealed ethic, full-orbed as Christian theology. <clears throat> as we look back to Henry's pioneering work in evangelical ethics, it's important to linger a bit over the significance of his call for ethics to be full-orbed as Christian theology. For a long time, I was content in my own thought to settle for less than this. This is a confession today, a lot of uh, paying my debts to Carl Henry. I was, I was inclined to, to settle for less than this, not, be, not, not, I must quickly add, because I was against a theology that is full-orbed, but because I did not think that we could ever find something worthy of that label that would be serviceable to the evangelical movement as a whole. My argument went along these lines. Given the coalition character of the evangelical movement, we cannot insist on an all-encompassing, tightly defined system of thought. Our evangelical coalition embraces a diverse mis mix of theological traditions, Reformed, Wesleyan, Pentecostal, Anglican, Free Church, Dispensationalist, and so on. The most we can hope for is that we can agree to rally around a common set of corrective emphases in theology and spiritual practice. The kinds of things associated, for example, with what has come to be known as the Bebbington Quadrilateral, referring to British historian David Bebbington's account of evangelicalism as essentially characterized by these four features, an emphasis on the need for conversion, a fidelity to biblical authority, a central emphasis of the atoning work of Christ on the cross of Calvary, and the insistence on a life of active discipleship. And what is true of evangelical theology in general, I argued, applies to ethics in particular. The most we can hope for as evangelicals is a shared set of corrective emphases in ethics rather than a detailed moral theology. Some of these ethical correctives have to do with matters that would have been almost universally taken for granted in the Christian past, but they're widely ignored today in much ethical discussion, such as the insistence that there is a God who has issued clear directives for the moral life, and that these directives are presented to us in an authoritative scripture and that we sinners, if left to our own devices, will inevitably be led astray by a human heart that is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Let me explain that I don't think that this argument of mine, which I have endorsed in the past, is completely wrongheaded. The argument that you can't have a full orb theology, just a set of corrective theological emphases for the movement as a whole. We do need an evangelical movement that can unite around common commitments, especially those that can serve as crucial correctives to much that is missing in present-day theology and ethics. But I don't think it's adequate simply to take those corrective emphases for granted and proceed from there to a common evangelical witness. Here's a bit of history to unpack my concerns on this topic. This fall is the 40th anniversary of the issuing of the Chicago Declaration of Evangelical Social Concerns, a document drawn up in November of 1973 by a group of us gathered in Chicago's downtown YMCA to affirm our shared commitment to working as evangelicals for issues of social justice. Carl Henry was a participant and he gave his blessing as a signer of that declaration. 
even though many of us had the clear impression that he wasn't altogether happy with everything the document affirmed, a fact confirmed by Henry's reflections on the Declaration in his autobiographical Confessions of a Theologian, published in 1986. Henry wasn't alone in his concerns. The Mennonite theologian John Howard Yoder refused to sign and a number of others expressed their disappointment that this or that item in the Declaration was not dealt with adequately. In retrospect, it is clear that this occasion was really the last time that many of us who were present could agree on a document of that sort. We would soon be engaging in serious debates among ourselves about matters of theology not the sorts of con consensus commitments typified by Bebbington's four-point list, but about more basic framing theological questions that had been long disputed in historic evangelicalism. For those of us who then represented the younger generation, our social consciences had been stirred up as students in the 1960s by the opposition to the Vietnam War and the civil rights struggles, all happening during a time when many evangelicals were still immersed in the otherworldly mentality that Carl Henry had associated with the uneasy conscience in his 1947 book. But for us in 1973, it was encouraging simply to join with other evangelicals including such venerable evangelical leaders as Carl Henry, Paul Rees, and Vernon Grounds, in, let it, in letting it be known that from here on, at least some evangelicals were going to be addressing structural, systemic, societal issues. It soon became clear to many of us, however, that being activist was not enough. We needed the kind of ethical discernment that could only come from a more substantive theological grounding. And this is where we began to move in separate directions after that Chicago gathering. Some, influenced by Yoder's seminal 1972 book, The Politics of Jesus, looked to the Anabaptist tradition. Others worked at recovering relevant themes from the Wesleyan past. The witness of Dietrich Bonhoeffer held promise for some for looking to Lutheran sources. Other of, us, other of us found our inspiration in Calvinism, particularly, uh, it's okay to say I'm a Calvinist here? Uh, okay, good. <laughs> particularly as it was developed by the great uh, 19th century theologian statesman, uh, Abraham Kuyper. It will surprise no one familiar with my own work that I have embraced the Kuyperian option. And for me, this has meant that one of the most important intra-evangelical engagements to pursue with great diligence <clears throat> has been a dialogue with representatives of the Anabaptist perspective, particularly with John Howard Yoder. The issues that Yoder and I debated both in print and in a number of public settings went deeper than our obvious disagreement about pacifism versus just war theory. Yoder once declared at a conference at Calvin College, a conference organized, uh, incidentally, by my dear friend and colleague of blessed memory, Paul Henry, the son of Carl and Helga. Yoder announced that when Jesus rejected Satan's offer of the nations of the earth, if only Jesus would bow before him, the Savior was, said Yoder, resisting the temptation to be a Calvinist. That assessment was Yoder's admittedly not very nice way of pointing to important differences between the Reformed and Anabaptist traditions regarding the permissibility of Christian participation in civil government as such. Yoder was calling for a Christian activism that stood over against the social, political, economic status quo. And the fact that he grounded this kind of active engagement in a strong following Jesus' ethical emphasis was and still is attractive to many evangelicals who were looking for a pattern of radical discipleship that is centered on a strong commitment to the person of Jesus Christ. 
The passion that characterized those post-Chicago Declaration intra-evangelical debates demonstrated for many of us that it's not enough simply to pledge to work together as evangelical activists who focus primarily on a set of consensus convictions about issues in moral theology. Yes, there is much in liberal Protestantism and Roman Catholicism that desperately needs correctives grounded in our shared evangelical convictions. And yes, there is much in the uneasy conscience of our collective evangelical past that we can also work together to correct. But the more we look to the diverse theological confessional traditions for much needed wisdom for present societal challenges and opportunities, the more we will find ourselves arguing with each other about matters that have always loomed large in theological discussion. In an important sense, for evangelicals, our talk about a shared commitment to the historic Christian faith masks the realities of what is more accurately thought of as the historic Christian faiths. Again, I'm not opposed to the idea of a diverse evangelical movement that is bonded together by a shared commitment to the supreme authority of God's Word, a passion for evangelism, and a firm de de desire to honor the Lord Jesus as the heaven-sent Savior who alone can save. Indeed, I love that kind of theological consensus, having happily presided for the past 20 years in a seminary community that has counted over 100 denominations represented in its student body and faculty. Henry himself promoted that broad movemental spirit in his leadership at Christianity Today. My problem then is not with a trans-confessional, trans-denominational, evangelical theological consensus. It's with a movement in which the only operative theology is of a generic evangelical variety. Here's an example of what I mean by this. Evangelicals are often accused of having a weak ecclesiology. And that's certainly a legitimate observation if we focus primarily on what we evangelicals do or do not say when describing what we hold in common. Billy Graham has said little about the nature of the church in his wonderful ministry. The National Association of Evangelicals doesn't require its members to, to subscribe to a detailed ecclesiology, nor has Christianity Today focused much on what we reform types label the marks of the true church. Among even, uh, influential evangelical scholars, F.F. F. Bruce and James Houston were formed by the Plymouth Brethren Movement, while James Packer and John Stott have ministered as, as Anglicans. The ecclesiological spectrum evident in those examples is a broad one. None of that should mean, however, that thick ecclesiology is not important for the evangelical movement. Indeed, my own conviction is that the impression that we often give about a lack of a robust ecclesiological understanding is, in fact, based on a genuine weakness in evangelicalism. To be sure, as a matter of mere social history, Alistair McGrath was right when he responded to the charge that evangelicals have what he called an underdeveloped ecclesiology by suggesting that maybe it's others who have overdeveloped ecclesiologies. <laughs> we evangelicals have long worried about ecclesiological perspectives that are, are so highly detailed and all-consuming that they crowd out other, uh, other important theological concerns. And so we respond by emphasizing some things such as the need for a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and the need to evangelize the lost that are often neglected by people who take delight in detailed ecclesiologies. Fair enough. But without careful attention to ecclesiology, we can get into serious theological trouble. There's plenty of evidence today that when we start with a theology that only features the emphases in the Bebbington quadrilateral, 
and then begin to water one or more of these items down, we're left with a movement that can easily be blown by every wind of doctrine. A generic evangelical theology is a weak basis for sustaining biblical orthodoxy. Much to be preferred is an evangelicalism that sharing some fundamental convictions that are ignored and even explicitly denied in the larger Christian community, an evangelicalism that eagerly enters into a freewheeling discussion of what we can best draw upon from the thick confessional traditions of the past in addressing urgent questions today about the church's life and mission. Gregory Thornberry has put it well in his recent fine study of what he labels Carl Henry's classic evangelicalism. It's important, writes Thornberry, that, quote, we get over our addiction to novelty and the misperceived pursuit of freedom from tradition, which leaves us lifeless to the legacy of those who went before us, end quote. Carl Henry was not simply a generic evangelical. To repeat his call on the opening pages of Christian personal ethics, evangelicals need, in his words, a comprehensive, revealed ethic, full-orbed as Christian theology. I do agree with several Southern Baptist scholars, most of them gathered here, Russell Moore, all of them gathered here, Russell Moore, Albert Moeller, Tim George, and others. I agree with them when they point out that Henry did not pay much attention to the doctrine of the church in most of his major publications. There's virtually nothing on that subject, for example, in his six-volume Magisterial God, Revelation, and Authority. But I do find some excellent attention to the church as a crucial community for spiritual moral formation in his Christian personal ethics, as in his insistence that Christian ethics must be, and I'm quoting him now a little bit, Christian ethics must be the ethics of the believing church. It is the moral inheritance of a fellowship of men and women separated unto God. The church is a spiritual, ethical, and vital creation that is divinely called into being with Christ as its head It is the household of God whose mission is to hold before the world the realities of redemptive morality." My own reading of Henry's theological intentions is that he did, in fact, have a thick ecclesiology, but that he chose not to push ecclesiological questions to the fore in his writings because he had uh, deep concerns about other theological issues and that on those other issues, he was also operating with a thick theology that was clearly shaped by an awareness of traditional theological resources. The issues that he did address, specifically doctrine of God and the nature of revelation, were ones in which Henry was willing, as he was not in the case of the theology of the church, he was willing to go to the wall to defend uh, what he saw as, a non-negotiable, as non-negotiable for a full-orb evangelical theology. And furthermore, on those non-negotiables, Henry was grounded in a classic Reformed theological perspective. This is where it gets good, actually. Uh, several years ago, in a paper given at a session on Henry's ethics at the Evangelical Th- Theological Society, I stated that I disagreed with Russell Moore who has criticized Henry for developing a a generic evangelical theology out of a desire to build what Moore described as a sustainable and theologically cohesive transdenominational evangelical movement. I responded to Moore's point by saying that I thought it was a good thing that Henry generally avoided confessional specifics in favor of more generic theological formulations. That was, I'm now convinced, a confused response on my part. The truth is that Henry was only selectively generic. Moore is right in saying that Henry did stay generic on ecclesiological questions, but on many other topics, Henry quite carefully went thick, especially when he had an opportunity to explore theological issues at considerable length. This is certainly, I'm convinced, 
on matters, the case I'm convinced on matters of the relationship between theology and ethics. I'm not going to demonstrate the truth of all of this with the detailed exposition of what Henry says about ethics. Suffice it to point out that in aspects of Christian social ethics in that chapter that he sees as, con as a contribution to what should basically inform the structure of social ethics. Henry defends Bart against Ritchell, and then in pointing to continuing weaknesses in Bart, he defends Brunner against Bart. But then Henry goes on to critique elements in Brunner's own thought, drawing on themes that have been prominent in classic reform thought, even quoting the Dutch Calvinist Cecil de Boer in making his own case. And in Henry's interpretation of the moral significance of the Sermon on the Mount in Christian personal ethics, he offers a detailed critique of the Anabaptist perspective, turning to what he explicitly labels the historic reformed view as the proper alternative. All of this leads me to be confident that, Henry had, that if Henry had given us a hefty volume on social ethics, he would have provided a reformed perspective that would have been in careful dialogue with the current theological scholarship of the day. His brief treatment in the Aspects book engages in conversation with many, much of the same scholarship that he interacts with in Christian personal ethics. In each case, he's conversant with American liberal theology, with the neo-Orthodox theologians of Western Europe, as well as with other prominent thinkers associated with the conciliar ecumenical bodies, the councils of churches. Today, we have, a somewhat, we have somewhat different conversational partners in discussions of Christian ethics. And many of those partners function within the broad evangelical community. Unfortunately, the rich discussion of various historical traditions, traditions that engaged many younger evangelicals in the wake of the Chicago Declaration is less visible. That kind of detailed discussion is less visible on the contemporary scene. Insofar as attention is given to historical traditions, much of it is highly selective. Many younger evangelicals engage in a kind of designer theology, a bricolage project, wherein we find elements drawn from the monastic tradition alongside some Anabaptist themes with an atonement perspective that draws heavily on the European post-World War II explorations of the principalities and powers. And there's also a discernible post-evangelical trend. That's what it's described as, post-evangelical trend. It features the rejection of the substitutionary atonement along with long-held evangelical convictions about sexual morality. To be sure, some kind of mixing and matching of elements from various theological traditions is inevitable for those of us who recognize an unnecessary wall building in our own theological camps. When I read, for example, the Stone Lectures that my theological hero, Abraham Kuyper, delivered at Princeton Seminary in 1898, I frequently bristle at some of his uncharitable comments regarding Catholicism, the Anabaptists, and Lutheran thought. I've learned much from those traditions, incorporating elements of each in my own reformed theological perspective. But I do see myself as bringing those into a thick confessional perspective that has a coherence as a system of thought that differs significantly on key points from those other traditions. In the aforementioned paper that I delivered a few years ago at the Evangelical Theological Society, I observed that I could detect some Hauerwasian type elements in Henry's ethical writings. While I have some serious disagreements with my friend Stanley Hauerwas on ethical matters, I meant the comparison in that case, at least in part, as a commendation. Stanley Hauerwas's writings have influenced many evangelicals these days to uh, have influenced many evangelicals these days to emphasize the church's call to be a separated community that nurtures patterns of discipleship that stand over against beliefs and practices of the prevailing culture, thus drawing on Harawas's provocative claim 
that the church does not have a social ethic, the church is a social ethic. Now we can find a similar emphasis in Henry's writings. In locating these themes in Carl Henry's thought has the special benefit of seeing how they function in the context of a theological perspective that is unimpeachably evangelical. That this is needed can be seen by thinking about what I see as Harawas's problematic insistence that it is better for the church to be a social ethic than to have one. I consider that problematic. What's going on in the place of being an ethic over against having an ethic? The church is called by God to be many things, and they cannot all be simply reduced to a social ethic. The church carries the memories of theological developments in the past. It evangelizes, catechizes, counsels, communicates with other churches, and much more. And most of us cannot simply be shaped by a social ethic that a particular church is or bees. Carl Henry was well aware of the underlying issues at stake here, which is why he insisted in his foundational chapter in Aspects of Christian Social Ethics that, and I'm quoting now, that a correct understanding of the whole range of Christian faith and duty turns on a proper comprehension of divine attributes. How the theologian defines and relates God's sovereignty, righteousness, and love actually predetermines his exposition of basic positions in many areas, in social ethics no less than in soteriology and eschatology." End quote. This makes it clear that the church cannot properly be anything without first of all having a well-worked-out, biblically sound understanding of who God is. In the course of his remarks on the overall theological contribution of Carl Henry, Russell Moore rightly observes that it's important to keep in mind in assessing Henry's thought that he was very much a man of his time. This is certainly important for grasping Henry's strong emphasis on the foundational nature of the divine attributes and insisting that we must be very clear about the nature of divine justice and divine benevolence. Carl Henry was addressing the tendencies of the liberal and neo-orthodox thinkers of his day to reduce one to the other with the liberals treating justice as a form of divine love, and the neo-orthodox separating the two, but where in a dialectical manner, justice will ultimately be absorbed into love. Each option, Henry warned, leads to devastating theological consequences. Again, I quote, let it be said that theology that obscures the distinction between justice and grace soon sponsors alien views of social ethics, and any social theory that confounds justice and benevolence will work against a true understanding both of the nature of God and of the character of the gospel." End quote. And we should be clear about the fact that it really is the character of the gospel that is at stake in our efforts to understand the shape of Christian ethics. One of the most influential books in philosophical ethics during the last few decades of the 20th century was Alasdair MacIntyre's 1984 book, After Virtue. There, MacIntyre argued that modern ethics had come to a dead end in the philosophical outlook of Friedrich Nietzsche in whose writings it became clear that philosophers no longer had any grasp of a proper human telos, with the telos being the conception of what a fully flourishing human being would be like. The only adequate corrective, McIntyre argued, was to return to the philosophy of Aristotle, who understood that a true ethic would have to be clear about three things, an understanding of the present condition of human nature, the where we are, a conception of the human telos, where we, where we ought to be headed, and some guidelines about how we can move from one to the other. That's an excellent framework for understanding the basics of what a robust Christian ethics should address. And it's worth mentioning that shortly after the publication of After Virtue, Alasdair MacIntyre converted to Christianity, becoming a devout Catholic. 
Indeed, McIntyre's three Aristotelian requirements lay out nicely the basic ethical concerns that guided Henry in his work in the field. On one level, the Christian address to the three requirements are easy to state. Present reality, we're sinners who fall far short of what we were created to be. And we need divine help to get us from our fallen condition to the state of human flourishing for which God created us. But these answers deserve deep and solid grounding in a theology that is based on fidelity to the supreme authority of the Bible. Yes, we're sinners, but it's urgent that we understand the devastating effects of our sinfulness for all areas of our lives in order properly to grasp what it takes to be rescued from our sinful state. The importance of these connections is nicely laid out by the 19th century Princeton theology, theologian Gerhardus Voss in a marvelous sermon he preached, Seeking and Saving the Lost, based on Jesus' declaration in Luke 19.10 that the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. Voss observes that to understand what he describes as the inherent logic of the structure of the gospel, to understand that, is to be clear about the fact that to dilute, dilute the meaning of the word lost, we must also dilute the meaning of what it means to save. A reduced understanding of our sinful condition inevitably leads to a reduced Savior. This simple but profound point captures nicely Carl Henry's concerns about the need for an ethic that is full-orbed as Christian theology. Gregory Thornberry appropriately gives the title Theology Matters to his chapter outlining the scope of Henry's theological interests. That title states the essence of Carl Henry's work in ethics. Theology matters much in our efforts to understand God's will for human morality. Henry recognized that our theology of God proper is intimately linked to our grasp of the extent of our sinful condition. And that's why, for example, he paid considerable attention in Christian personal ethics to the theology of the noetic effects of the fall, devoting 50 pages to the relationship of special and general revelation, the image of God, conscience. In traditional reformed and non-Bardian fashion, he affirms a continuing natural content to the ethical awareness of fallen humanity. The Imago Dei in humankind has not been completely destroyed by the fall, but Henry insists the content of the moral Imago is apparent to the sinner only in the light which special revelation sheds. And because this light can only be effectively received by those who have been transformed by sovereign grace, Henry also devotes considerable attention to those systems that underplay the seriousness of sin's impact on our fallen consciousness. Thus, the connections intimately linking the theology of the divine attributes with both soteriology and ethics. We're lost sinners, incapable of initiating or contributing to our own salvation. That fact leads to an all-important question, what would it take to save us? A question that in turn leads us to, insist, to the insistence that given our desperate condition, our salvation can only be brought about by a God who is both loving and just. In articulating all of that, Carl Henry was giving us crucial theological ethical counsel for present day evangelicalism. We serve a God who so loves sinners like us that he sent the Son to do for us what we could never do for ourselves, to satisfy the ju just demands of a righteous sovereign by bearing the full weight of our guilt and shame on the cross of Calvary. And having drawn near to us in Jesus Christ, that loving and just God instructs us in the ways of righteousness, instructions that we desperately need for our moral lives, lest we turn again to our own sinful ways. Surely that is an exciting expression of a full-orbed Christian ethic that still we must strive for in this 21st century. Thank you.